It is another pivotal week for President Joe Biden. Democratic lawmakers continue to question whether he should exit the 2024 presidential race after his faltering debate against former President Donald Trump. There are a lot of colleagues who share my concern but have not gone public. I think he should step aside. I think it's become clear that he's not the best person to carry the Democratic message. I say, Mr. President, your legacy is set. We owe you the greatest debt of gratitude. The only thing that you can do now to cement that for all time and prevent utter catastrophe is to step down and let someone else do this. And those voices you heard were Representative Seth Moulton of Massachusetts, Representative Adam Smith of Washington, and Representative Mike Quigley of Illinois, all Democrats. It's important to note, we're still talking about a small number of people, but we know from our reporting that the House Democratic Caucus is, and the Senate, is, is deeply divided over Biden's candidacy, whether he should remain at the top of the ticket. Yasmin Abu Talib is a White House reporter for The Post. In the last couple of days, we've seen President Biden be pretty defiant. I'm getting so frustrated by, by the elites. Now, I'm not talking about you guys, but about the elites in the party who they know so much more. But any of these guys yeah. don't think I should let them run against me. Go ahead, announce the announce president. Challenge me at the convention. He has attacked what he's called elites, uh, talking about donors and even some lawmakers saying he, he's taken on this populist tone about his candidacy where he said, I'm not going to let elites and pundits bully me out of the race. I'm the candidate. I'm staying in. I'm the best person to defeat Donald Trump. I mean, if the Lord Almighty came out and said, Joe, get out of the race, I'd get out of the race. The Lord Almighty's not coming down. The big question going forward is, can President Biden get his party behind him? I wouldn't say right now he's got full-throated support, but you saw a lot of people voicing concerns, basically saying the president needs to show us, not tell us that he's up for it. This week is a huge week for Biden. I think it's pretty hard to overstate just how important this week is for him. Um, And so I think the big question is, does he have more support, more vocal support by the end of the week or less? From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Tuesday, July 9th. Today, I talk with Yasmin about Biden's fracturing support within his own party and the next big test he'll face this week with world leaders. So, Yasmin, we're here talking a little after noon on Tuesday, um, and we've just heard this sample of elected Democrats who are suggesting and some are explicitly calling for Biden to step aside. Um, Can you walk me through, like, where we are in terms of those calls and the number of people, um, the range of people who who are making these kinds of calls? So far, we have nine House Democrats who have called for President Biden to step aside. We have six of them publicly and three of them privately that our colleagues have reported. We don't have anyone in the Senate explicitly calling for President Biden to step aside. But you do have a number of really important senators, people like Senator Mark Warner, who is the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Chris Murphy, Senator John Tester. You have Senator Patty Murray, who is one of the most senior members of the Senate Democrats, saying President Biden needs to show them more, that he needs to prove to them that he is up for this campaign. So they haven't called for him to step aside, but they haven't said he's our nominee and we're standing behind him. So I think they are signaling to the president he still has to do a lot more to really get their support. And what does that more look like? Like, what are they calling for Biden to do that that in their eyes would convince them like they should be comfortable with Biden as the nominee going forward? Well, I think we know from our reporting that privately, many of these people just don't want Biden to be the nominee. But given the president's defiance, I think people are coming to terms with the fact that it is going to be very, very difficult to convince him to step aside. So short of that, I think what they want to see, and we know he had a call with his uh, congressional campaign co-chairs on Saturday, people told him he needs to be out there doing more town halls, more press conferences. I think the concern that the debate brought up is that the president 
is not battle-tested in unscripted settings, that his aides have hewed him in so closely that all his events are with a teleprompter, even small fundraisers. Yeah, and we, we heard this actually in the episode of the campaign moment that we had yesterday with Matt Beiser and Aaron Blake, our colleagues, that like even in like someone's living room, um, this intimate setting that Biden is still using a teleprompter and that has raised some red flags. Exactly. Matt did a great story about Biden's reliance on teleprompters and these sort of awkward scenes where it's a very small room and there is a teleprompter in front of him. Uh, he's. We know from our reporting there have been a lot of uh, fundraisers where he's not taking questions from donors, which has mm. really frustrated donors. And I think the concern that the debate brought up is, can he not be quick on his feet? Can he not actually handle unscripted settings? Why did it take him so long to do a television interview? So we know that members of Congress are telling him he needs to do a lot more of these events where he's taking questions, being able to answer them on the fly and not relying on a teleprompter. He needs to sort of move away from these very carefully scripted events. But as you pointed out, Biden has been so defiant in all of this and is is getting even more so um, and is pretty explicitly dismissive of kind of the the pundits and elites, as he calls them. So I'm curious, like, why does he care more about what uh, members of the Senate and the House think than, you know, maybe members of his own staff or or some of the Democratic operatives that he is um, more willing to be like to, to dismiss, essentially? Well, I think there are a couple of things to unpack there. So I think right now his senior staff and his family are very much behind him. We know that some of his staff might have private concerns, but they're not being brought to the president. Hmm. And so I think, and this is some of the source of frustration of Democrats, is that his staff and his family, especially his senior aides who have been with him for decades, are very much encouraging him to to keep moving forward, to keep running. It's important to remember that President Biden spent 36 years in the Senate, so it matters a lot to him what these are his former colleagues Mm -hmm. and what they think does matter a lot to him. And what we've heard is the, if anything, were to convince President Biden, and I think that is a steep hill to climb at this point, it would be very convincing polling data that Democrats could lose the House and the Senate if Mm. he were at the top of the ticket. But he says he has not seen that. I was told by one Democratic lawmaker that the data is mixed right now. There's not sort of clear-cut data either way. That polling data will start to come out in the next week or two. But if anything is going to change the calculus here of, of whether Democrats become more outspoken, I think that will be it. If their chances of recapturing the House and maintaining their hold on the Senate is really jeopardized by having President Biden at the top of the ticket. I also want to talk about the letter that Biden sent to members of Congress recently. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, the president sent this letter on Monday, and this is unusual. I can't remember the last time he's had this sort of mass communication with lawmakers. And he basically said, there's been a lot of speculation about my candidacy since the debate. And he basically said, we're done having that debate I am saying at the top of the ticket, I am the Democratic nominee. And he said, I would not be running if I did not truly believe I was the best person to defeat Donald Trump. And then he sort of went on to explain his campaign pitch. But this was a call to Democrats to shut down the debate, to make very clear he has no intention of going anywhere and to try to get the party to move on. And then in addition to this letter, you have this Zoom call that he had on Monday night with the Congressional Black Caucus. Tell me about that call and why that's important. He had this Zoom call with the Congressional Black Caucus, which is this very influential 60-member group in the among House Democrats. And what our colleagues reported from that call is that members said, you know, we're going to have your back just like you've always had ours. And I think for President Biden, this is really crucial because this is a key voter base that he needs, Black voters. Uh, We know from our reporting that members came away and said, you know, they're their constituents don't want uh, the sort of risk of replacing someone at the top of the ticket now. And President Biden has had a long relationship with many of these members. Jim Clyburn, who is a key member of the Congressional Black Caucus, basically helped Biden win the nomination in 2020 because he delivered him South Carolina. And so for President Biden to have this to point to, I think, gives him sort of a bulwark to anyone else who says, step aside, he needs to think about his legacy. This he can point to and say, this is a key part of the Democratic base and they want me to stay on the top of the ticket. So I think it gives him just another sort of fighting point uh, for people who are push- trying to push him aside.
In addition to the Congressional Black Caucus, the president did receive unequivocal support for some pretty key and surprising quarters on Monday. Uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, of course, is an influential progressive lawmaker, said President Biden is the nominee. This isn't being litigated anymore. We need to move on. Joe Biden is our nominee. He is not leaving this race. He is in this race, and I support him. Now, what I think is critically important... Which I think is, is something he really needed because we know he is struggling with progressive and young voters. Ilhan Omar, who has been very critical of the president because of his Middle East policy, said he's the best president of our lifetime and that she Hmm. supports him. That one, I think, was probably the one that surprised me the most on on Monday, just given the way she's talked about the president the last couple months on his Middle East policy. Mm -hmm. And then Senator Mark Kelly said he supported the president being the nominee. So there is, of course, this skepticism and this small number of defections, but there were some statements of support last night. And of course, I think the caveat for all of this is everything could change in a moment. The president is under so much scrutiny right now. All of his public appearances that maybe otherwise would be sort of unnotable are under intense scrutiny. And so I think another performance or public appearance like the debate could, of course, undo all of this. All right, let's take a quick break there. Then after that break, we're going to talk about how the president is trying to rally support within his party and specifically how Democratic donors are responding to these concerns about Biden's candidacy. We'll be right back. So it seems like there's this push and pull in this moment, that there are some members of the House and the Senate who have raised concerns to Biden, who have publicly or privately asked him to step aside. But then you have the Congressional Black Caucus that is standing behind him in a more supportive way. And it remains to be seen, like, who is going to win in their messaging here. Tell me about um, how pivotal this week is in terms of these competing messages and um, which ones kind of get to Biden. It's sort of incredible how much is unfolding all at once this week. So you, of course, had Congress returning for the first time since the debate on Monday. And this was really the president's first test to see if when lawmakers came back, started hearing from donors, were thinking about what they heard from their constituents after the debate, whether there would be new defections or calls for him to step aside. He managed to avoid new defections on Monday, which I think was probably his best day since the debate in terms of trying to maintain some support among his party. Then he's hosting all of the leaders of the Western Alliance for the NATO summit, which is here in Washington this week. So we know there's going to be a lot of attention and scrutiny on how he seems in private meetings, how he seems in public, because for foreign leaders, Biden's viability as a candidate is directly tied to the likelihood of a Donald Trump presidency and what they need to do to prepare. We know that they're extremely worried about this. And then the biggest event of this week is Biden's press conference on Thursday. And I think everyone is going to be watching that extremely closely. He has not... And and, sorry, just to be clear, because I feel like people should understand this. Like, this isn't... I think you would assume that the president does these kinds of press conferences all the time, but Biden does not. That's that's exactly what I I was going to say, is the, the president does press conferences, but he usually does what are called two-by-twos, and it's Mm. he'll be hosting a foreign leader or maybe he'll be overseas, and he will take two questions from American reporters and then two questions from foreign reporters, and that's it. So these tend to be very short press conferences, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Mm. It's not a free-for-all where everyone can raise their hand and he's freely calling on people. Usually the people are picked ahead of time. And so uh, we'll see what they have planned for Thursday, but I think they are under enormous pressure to show that Biden can handle. The White House keeps jokingly referring to it as a big boy press conference because <laughs> a reporter called it that and they seem to have fully embraced the term, you know, oh, saying God. he is going to do a big boy press conference. Basically, like the, the implication being that he, that Biden doesn't do real press conferences and that he's only doing like the kids version. Which is why it's surprising to me the White House has sort of embraced this term that yeah. that came in the form of a question. But I do think they're under pressure to show he can handle a long, sustained press conference with multiple questions. You mentioned a little bit about these conversations that are happening between donors and Biden. Can you dive more into that? Like, what are these conversations like and what are donors actually saying? And are are they just saying stuff or are they talking with their money, either donating or not donating right now? 
It's a little bit early to tell what exactly is happening with the donors. We know from our colleagues reporting that donors have expressed a lot of private concerns. They've talked about maybe focusing their money on congressional races instead of giving it to Biden. The campaign has talked a lot about how they've had some of their best fundraising days since the debate. Um, and a lot of that is small dollar fundraising. Uh, but there, Biden did dial into a donor call on Monday. Um, and we got a pretty good readout of that call where donors reiterated their support for Biden. And they asked him, you know, what would be his strategy for the next debate against Trump? And Biden said, attack, 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 attack. Well, if there is a next debate, because I think that is quite up in the air. And Trump has said that he doesn't feel like he should do another one because he feels so bad for Biden. That's that's a great point. We have no idea if another debate will actually happen because there are so many complicating factors right now. And it's not supposed to be until September, which is sort of a lifetime away. And we know that Biden said on that call, we are done talking about the debate. So again, I think Monday was a day of sort of Biden making very, very clear. He has no intention of going anywhere. And he made it clear to many important key constituents. He made it clear to Democratic lawmakers on Capitol Hill. He made it clear to donors. And he also dialed into Morning Joe. So he made it clear to the general public. I think there are larger questions here about our aides and staff and the people around Biden. Like, what are the steps that they're taking to protect him? And are they being transparent? Like, do they know more about his health? Or, and do they are, are they aware of things that they are not sharing publicly? And like, what is your read on that? That's absolutely true. So my colleagues and I did a story late last week about just people who have been in private meetings with the president over the last several months saying signs of his aging have accelerated in recent months. And they talk mostly about physical aging, the stiffer gait, that he just moves around slower. But they also talked about that he has these more frequent lapses where he's losing his train of thought before he gets back on track or sometimes seems less engaged. We know from sources that foreign leaders felt this way as well when they were with President Biden at the G7. Um, and there have been a number of these stories from major outlets since the debate. And I think what's happening is there are these moments with the president that many people sort of overlooked or excused. And mm. his debate performance is making them revisit these meetings, interactions they've had with him and say, uh, maybe there's something larger going on here. Maybe his aging really is a problem. And that has also raised scrutiny of his aides and the way they carefully script his events, what they allow and don't allow him to do. And of course, White House aides will strongly, strongly push back against this and say President Biden is as sharp as he's ever been. Any physical slowing has no bearing on his ability to be president. And they will share these anecdotes of how he's still sharp in, in meetings, asking all these probing, detailed policy questions. So that's that's the source of tension right now. Yes, I mean, as you've said, this is a critical week for Biden, and there is a lot happening and changing very quickly. Um, what are your big questions that you have going forward, looking at these next few days and how it all shapes out? I think for me, the the for all of us, the biggest thing we're looking to see is how he does at the press conference on Thursday, because I think that event has the ability to either temporarily shore up Democratic support and maybe stop this steady drumbeat of people either questioning his candidacy or outright calling for him to exit the race, or if he has another debate-like performance at the press conference that could sort of reopen the floodgates. Nesmeen, thank you so much for sharing all this. Thank you. Yasmin Abu Talib is a White House reporter for The Post. Here's what else I'm following today. Baldwin, the actor Alec Baldwin was in court in Santa Fe, New Mexico today for the first day of his trial on charges of involuntary manslaughter. The trial began nearly three years after a loaded gun that Baldwin was holding went off during the filming of the movie Rust, killing the movie's cinematographer and injuring its director. Baldwin has denied pulling the trigger. He could face up to 18 months in prison if he's convicted. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. If you want to show your support for the show, please subscribe to The Washington Post. Not only is it a great way to help us continue to do this work, but you can now get access to Washington Post podcasts ad-free in Apple Podcasts. Subscribe in Apple Podcasts or by following the link in our show notes. 
Today's show was produced by Peter Bresnan and Alana Gordon. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Monica Campbell and Lucy Perkins. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post. Thank you.